Well, good evening and welcome. So, Thank you. we're delighted you're all here. This is an exercise in friends and neighbors, so this really works well. So, so many of you I know already, but uh, I want to welcome you to this incredible exhibition. And it's incredible on several different levels. Um, we did this as an exercise three years ago. <clears throat> we were invited by the County House Museum to show a portion of our collection. But it's gone topsy. Uh, we've had groups come. It, the museum's only open two or three hour, days, excuse me, hours a week. But we've had so many groups come of many different levels. Other museums have come here. Um, lecture tours have um, germinated from here. Uh, graduate students from uh, several universities here. Uh, curators from the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, Pratt Institute in New York. People have come here. The historic Deerfield has sent their whole curatorial staff here. So it, it's an important exhibit and we've extended. This is our third season. So here we are. But the most wonderful and intoxicating thing is we get to show it to our neighbors. It really means a lot to us to have Berwick here. Um, we haven't had much of an attendance from Berwick residents. And um, so you, this is the flagship, I guess. <laughs> and um, there is an exam, 40 minutes. <laughs> um, but let's go inside, and Nancy and I'll talk we a little bit more. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is a, um, I guess we can say a labor of love. So <laughs> it, uh, it took us about seven months to assemble this collection after we were invited to be here. A number of renovations had to take place in order for this exhibit to be in this room. Um, it represents somewhere between five and seven percent of our collection, I mean our personal collection. We live on Diamond Hill Road and that road for many years, centuries, was Tear Shirt Road. If you look at the 1872 map, it shows Tear Shirt Road. And that road has been changing over the years, and very recently it's been changing a lot. So, But we own the farm at the base of the hill there, and that's called Tear Shirt Farm. And the most wonderful thing about that is we found out the day we purchased that property over 40 years ago, or about 40 years ago, tear, is, tear shirt means dress linen, and that's in our deed. So at the closing, we saw this in the deed, and it was like the clouds lined up on our behalf because both of us are textile specialists. We um, um, come from a background of museum work as well as education teaching. And uh, we have advanced degrees in uh, textiles as well as museum administration. So it, this is all of our fun coming together. So it's really a lot of, of us in it. We welcome questions. We want you to, to um, um, look and see and think about uh, so many of, of these objects because so many of them are from the area. Each of these objects has a wonderful story. And it was all we could do to cut down the, the inventory for here. So we're really glad to talk about that. Nancy, I'm wondering if you could begin just by telling how this is divided up and how we got started with that. Okay. You mean production versus products? Sure. Yeah. And when Peter says we cut it down, we have 103-ish. Yeah, but 100. I think 104. Objects, yeah, um, yeah. Objects here in the gallery. But what was most important to us was that we showed, um, we carried the theme of early textile production through the whole exhibition, and that it isn't just the tools or the. Um, the results of textile production in this area, but it's a mix of um, images that show the process of making textiles. Uh, that's uh, evident through the artwork that you see on all the walls. And then um, we had wanted to include uh, books. So we have uh, records of weaving and dye books over in the case here. We have um, earthen pottery used for dyeing over there, but we have fine um, 
fine uh, ceramics, tra transfer wear in this case that show also the processes of spinning and weaving. Um, let's see. So it, it's everything. It's, it's the tools, the products, um, the records of how these things came together. There's a diary. Um, there are sales receipts. Um, yeah, and, and not only uh, examples of uh, textile furnishings, textiles that would be worn, but also textile home furnishings, such as the bed I'm standing next to, all the parts that are on that. Um, so that meant a lot to us. And we divided the gallery in such a way that principally the tools are on that side of the gallery and the objects are on this side of the gallery, the results. But we have some surprises in store for you when, when we start looking around. Um, as Peter said, um, these objects have stories not only about their provenance, where they came from before we acquired them, um, but also there are some pretty humorous stories about um, how we acquired yeah. them the <laughs> that we'll share process. too. Because yeah. yeah. some of them it was easy, and some of it, some of them it was uh, a challenge. Kind of a mystery, yeah, a challenge, a mystery, a fun challenge, yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll share that with you. Do you have a cutoff time as far as how far you know modern times you yeah. go into like you know the, oh. the mill mill era? Yeah, so stuff? really good question. We um this exhibition covers probably the early early part of um, the settlement in this region, not the not the 17th century portion, but would you say like the mid 18th century yeah. up to about 18, 20, 30? Just prior Just to the opening the 19th of the mills? Century. Yeah, we start yeah. with some 17th century objects here, yeah. meaning the Pilgrim century, and we go up to about 1820. Mm -hmm. These, uh, the, the product here, are objects that were generated primarily in New England. So right. we don't have uh, printed textiles uh, from, uh, from England, say, right. uh, or France. Uh, those twalls and so on were here and used. But we limited the scope of this exhibition to the homespun period um, um, in New England itself. Can I have a follow-up to that? Uh, so, yeah. is there besides the Lawrence Mills that do the, mm -hmm. the Industrial Revolution here? Right. Um, are there any one, say, New Hampshire or Maine that that covers that era, like when the French came down and worked the mills, or just in the Oh, the absolutely. Yes, the Rollinsford Mills um, have just the most tremendous story of all. Um, as a matter of fact, just last week there was a lecture at the Rollinsford Library um, that was standing room only with a speaker about the history of the mills there, which dates back to 1830s yeah. for the oldest part of the mill there. There were about 65 so. of us jammed into a small room. Right. But it was absolutely yeah, it would be a um, talk we should dynamic. Have Berwick sometime because it did include a lot of um, the Great Works mill history as well, yeah. right? Uh, Summersworth across from. Uh, that would from, be, yeah. That would be from, excellent for the history. From Rollinsford, you know, before Rollinsford was yeah. Rollinsford, when it was still a part of Summersworth, a long time ago. So um, something um, fun that you might like to see, because you, some, some of you have known us for a little while, um, <laughs> would be <laughs> when we were asked um, to, for photo a photograph of ourselves <laughs> for the exhibition space. Um, we thought, well, people know what we look like now. They see us around. So when you get to the panels in the corner here about material culture, explaining what we've just shared about um, the why of this exhibition, you'll see that there are pictures of Peter and I as guest curators. And the pictures we selected are about the same vintage, 19, right about 1979, 1980. And something that I think is particularly wonderful about them is it's actually from before we met. And we were both just about in, a year or two before. Yeah, yeah. Both in museum settings, Peter was spinning and I was weaving. So, oh, wow. yeah, really so cool. it's a p personal touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we know yeah, it's a personal collection yeah. in many ways. Yeah. yeah, we've been collecting for over 50 years between. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, my gray hair is legitimate. So yeah, have <laughs> been doing at it a long time. Right. The gallery has been in, was enlarged to accommodate just this modest part of our collection. Uh, these cases came from um, uh, Berwick Academy. These, these were old trophy cases. And we re reconditioned them and uh, 
applied them to our um, them. space, they painted them and so on. Yeah. Uh, we, I need to give credit to uh, Ruth Green McNally, who was a professional curator who was hired to work with us. And she was hired by uh, uh, the uh, County House Museum. And, and uh, she wishes she could be with us this evening. But uh, she did a lot of work in cataloging. All these objects had to be measured, had to be photographed, condition reports. Um, and uh, so many of them are, are really very significant. This is called a press bed or slaw bed. It's, remember, when we're looking at early colonial homes, the space was at a premium. They didn't have that much space, and what space they did have, they had to heat. So here we have a press bed. So it's like an early Murphy. And, uh, the bed hangings themselves are Josiah Bartlett's, meaning we own the, he was the signer of the Declaration of Independence, and this is part of our collection. We're very proud that we have this. Whole, we have a whole set here, but we adapted this for this because we couldn't bring a bed out here. We really had to study uh, the space that we had to make them. I think these may have been produced in Kingston, New Hampshire, which was just about a mile from the Bartlett homestead. And he was, a, I don't know if how many of you know about Josiah Bartlett, but he was, um, he was the governor. He was a signer of the Declaration of it. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He was a practicing surgeon, um, busy guy, but he lived right next door in that Kingston Mill. And I suspect I'm doing some research on that. Uh, we know a lot about his collection. And it was, uh, the house is privately owned now, and the collection was dispersed about 25 years ago. I attended that auction, didn't get these at that time, but um, followed, my, did a little research and knew the right people, and we wound up finding them and acquiring them. Kind and then fun. years later, we found like the rest of the beds. Yeah, we, we, we had to find it in two sections, yeah. yeah. It had been divided up at the auction, yeah. and then so, we brought it back together. So that's the original? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And you yeah. found it two different pieces? Two different, well, two the, different pieces. Several. There's about nine pieces to the whole collection. Okay. Right. There's the, the balance up the top. The, and, so, and then, of course, this is a, an 18th century uh, tick or uh, uh, bed cover, which is below here, or, or uh, for the mattress, you know. Mm -hmm. Rope for bed. Yeah, we yeah. have the we, full set, but we couldn't fit yeah. a full sure. tester bed <laughs> here. But the bed in our house is actually one of these. I thought you were saying someone that's what we, we sleep on. Yeah. Why would you do that? Yeah, well, <laughs> so. They did split up the bed curtains. Did they? And we, so we found them from two of two separate sites no. to put them back together. But no. this is just two pieces, really. It's the head cloth that would be behind the headboard on the wall and the, the end valance of the bed here. And if you look really close, you can see that just for, for the visual, I, uh, I photocopied the okay. side pieces. Just to make it work for that setting, so, yeah. Because we didn't have pieces that short to hang in this installation. <laughs> yeah. cool. That's a historic New England trick. <laughs> Going around here. Um, some fun things. Um, I have stories about every, well, Nancy and I do, have stories about every one of these objects, as I mentioned before. And if you just ask us which one you'd like us to a amplify on <laughs> or talk about, we'd be glad to. I'll, I'll start off maybe with this little thing. This is a picture. It's called Transferware. It was produced between 1790 and about 1805. And I discovered this in Bath, England. I was on a um, lecture tour and um, went into this incredible shop and saw that on a shelf. It was beyond my means. Oh, I hate to leave that there. I put it up on the shelf and pushed it back and, because it was just crowded with creamware. It took me two years to get back there. I'll never forget walking in there. I was with Abbott Lowell Cummings, who was the, the two of us were um, the directors of Historic New England. Maybe some of you know about that organization. We were on another lecture tour and fundraiser, and I went into that shop, and the man said, I'll never forget, he said, is there something you're looking for? I said, well, I'd like to just kind of browse around. And went in. 
<laughs> directly. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I'd like to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, the, the, that's the kind of story I'm talking about. It's kind of fun in acquisition. Um, if you look at it, these are textile activities spinning on the, and shearing and so on on the outside of a house, the exterior. And then if you look over on the other, on the interior. So, so it's, it's just fun. We have, Maybe, how many, has any of you heard of Portobello Road? It's a, it's a shopping area in London. It's all the flea markets and so on. And we saw that, and that was beyond our means too, but we were on, we wound up in Ireland on that trip, and we crowded, we jammed our, the two of us into a well, telephone yeah, booth. We talked about it and, like, um, for days, like, it, that woke up was really wonderful. It certainly was. <laughs> so we, across from Trinity College in Dublin, we called the dealer, we had his card, and said we had to do it. So there was a, it was peanut butter for the rest of the trip, but <laughs> we bought it, it was kind of fun. Yes, cool. it has a wonderful phrase on the front. A kinetic dealer that I worked with, um, you know, in buying as a museum curator and um, also as a collector, um, he gave us a lot of things and uh, he, um, I purchased a lot of things for museums and so on. And then one day, um, this was sent to me, it was a gift from him. This is silver, a little silver spinning wheel. And he died about a week later, so he was making sure that that came to us. So, so those kinds of personal treasures, it's all part of the fun and um, means a lot to us. If you look over here and this kind of, you can see lots of different types of, um, these are pockets that women would wear. And this is American Cruel. Uh, we believe these are Northern New England. Notice how they, every little scrap of fabric, they would save it, they'd sail with something in. You're saying uh, those are pockets? Those are pockets. So they strength, the they wear them right around in the front and then underneath their apron. Huh. So, so this, that's American Cruel. These are some curtains, early curtains. These are 18th century uh, blankets. This is the Ichabod Lord flame stitch purse for a man. And uh, we know about the Lord family in Berwick. And uh, that was a real treasure. I was able to acquire that before we moved to Berwick um, some 38 years ago. Um, these are 18th century Lindsay Woolseys that are all folded up. But we can, I can show you pictures of them up and down. These are our mug shots that Nancy I talked know. about over there. Yeah. This is an 18th century bed. I mean, it's really 18th century. It's not just a child's toy or anything. But Nancy dressed it. Nancy is a specialist in uh, uh, bed furniture, and she dressed this with um, period fabrics. So. This is probably a late 17th century American needle case. It's silver, and that was my gift to Nancy uh, for our 25th uh, anniversary. So. These are hems, a hem for a petticoat. So often they would save those. Uh, one, I'm going to turn you loose in just a moment, but I want to just tell tell you a little story about this because this Come on, loom. loom, yeah, take a look at here this loom. I was teaching history, I was in my 20s. Uh, I was teaching history at Berwick, excuse me, at Catskill Academy in Catskill, New York. And I heard about a woman named Faith Smith. This is Faith. She was born in 1899, and she lived in a, the Van Vechten house, which was built in 1690, one of the wonderful Dutch stone houses. And I heard, and I, about her, and I read an article about her, and I just had the chutzpah, many of you know how shy I am, and um, I walked up to his, her door, knocked on it, and said, I want to learn how to spin flax and wool. And that little woman said, come on in. I'll never forget it. I had no idea that that would change my life. So after school, after I was teaching all day, I would go by her house, 
And so I brought my wife and, and uh, our young children over to, to meet her and so on. And she became a very close family friend. And she taught me how to spin. This is in 1967. And I've been spinning ever since. How I went old back were to. You, Peter? Uh, well, like, what was that, 20. <laughs> 67, what would that be? 26, probably some, something like that. I mean, I'm in my 80s now, so yeah. yeah um, like 20 anyway, um, but anyway, we really became very good friends. We always had our Thanksgiving dinner at, at her house. This is at the Museum of Fine Arts for the major exhibition that Nancy and I worked on called New England Begins. We took her, when I went to lecture in England, we took her with us and so on. She really was a remarkable weaver and spinner and um, a dear friend. This loom, she was delivered to her house during the Second World War and sold to her for three dollars, and I've got it down here in my notes, about three dollars and fifty cents. The man knew she had many fireplaces and it would be nice if she had this lumber to burn. She figured out it was a loom, taught herself to weave, and she, that changed her life. But because of her and my spinning, I went back to school, took a master's in museum administration and took off with my career in, um, in uh, museum work. So it was a lot of fun. So I mentioned that, but I've told that story to many graduates and students. It's things like that that can change your life when you just a, a bit of serendipity on your behalf. So, mm -hmm. and look at the fun, you know, <laughs> we've had, it's taken us all over the world. Nancy and I have visited many countries in Asia, Europe, Eastern Europe, South America, Australia, and so on, all about textiles and students and having fun. So it's been quite a, a wild ride, and we're still on it. Can one of you explain the term pop goes the weasel? It has something to do with spinning. Oh, it does. Yeah, and actually we can... Oh, here was Over here. here is the actual tool that makes the pop. <laughs> This is called a skeiner, and as it winds up... It's a, called a clock reel, skeiner, yep. correct? And um, I don't think this, this particular one has, it doesn't have a working mechanism, but usually there is a wooden wheel inside that, and... Um, this is all geared. A gear. So, so many turns, oh, 40, go ahead. Yeah, For 40 four turns. turns. And it pops, it goes click. Pop, pop goes the weasel. And uh, that's the pop goes yeah. the weasel. So is that round around the... Yeah. Around the goes, yeah. Yep. So it's that's a, fun a yard. two yards around. And a particular unit or measure of wool, um, 40 yards is called a knot, and eight knots is called a skein. So you're taking um, what you've spun and, and then spun. measuring it. That's, that's basically right. measuring device. Yep. Okay. measuring. I, I, I wasn't sure if it was in the spinning process or in the... Yeah, okay. in, in, that, um, in that process. And then you're, at that stage, with your skein, you have the choice of dyeing the yarn or not, or, not, or using it in its natural um, color. That's why there's no... No little bump right here, so you can move it Side off. Right? Out. right. Good for you. Yeah. So then you bundle it up and right? yeah. so what, sell it. Yeah. 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 What would a skein of, of say wool yarn like cost? What it would it cost? Oh, today well, then. or then? Oh gosh, hard to know. Um, but there's a bill because there. there's some there are oh, some yeah. bills <laughs> over here for linen. Eighteenth um, century. Eighteenth century. Uh, math though you'd have to figure that out but this is this is kind of fun that you get to see both of these because this is a tool for winding the skein so these two objects are for unwinding the skein after you've dyed it so both of them have the um, ability to change size depending on um, how big your skein is after washing and maybe after dyeing it so on this one which is sometimes known as a squirrel cage um, <laughs> skeiner, um, has these open barrel sort of things, but the lower one goes up and down uh, for your size. And then on the one behind, you use the sticks to decide um, where your skeiner is tight. So both of those serve the purpose that um, sometimes people, I don't know any knitters here, but you know, you need to put your yarn on something, the back of a chair or have, have your loved one hold it for you <laughs> while you take it from a skein into a ball of yarn. But that's what those tools are for. Um, if you look over in that 
large wheel, in fact, I would probably talk about that maybe. There's a little ball of yarn there. And then there's a ball of yarn over here. You see this little ball that's in there? You, those little balls of yarn, you'd use them sometimes to throw it across on your loom. So you need a little loom basket right here. Stick <laughs> all your yeah. balls in there? And, uh, you know, I mentioned that this is our collection, but we do have four or five objects here that are extremely important that were loaned to us. And this is out of the Beauvais house. So this is it. <laughs> and we have the owner of it here. So. It came from the Lord House? Oh, oh, oh this, yeah, well, this is from the Lord House. Can you have the order for it? Mm -hmm. Where they bought it? Or no, was no, no. Oh. It could have been home manufactured, but yeah. yeah. Do you have a loan? No. 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 Yeah. And the shuttle is still on a tray. I'm looking for it. No, that, that, there are shuttles with trays. Like, but uh, flying shuttles and so on. No, this is done by hand. Yeah. It's probably late 18th century Hudson Valley again. Okay. We have a, a many of these looms. I mean, like over. And they're still to be found. They are. There have been two found in an old houses here in Berwick just this year. Really? Tucked yep. way up, way, way, way up in the under attic. the eaves yep. in the lofts. Yep. So we're yeah. really happy about that. Yeah. yeah. So is this operational? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, all, not in yeah. its absolute present state right here in the exhibition, but yes, definitely. Um, yeah. It, um, for a long time, it was in our kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> in so fact, it was uh, handy to use in yeah. the kitchen. And it was used for, as a whelping box. That's flax, right? Yes, that's correct. A whelping box for our dog. This is a... Uh, very early wool wheel. We call them wool. Some people call them walking wheels, and, or some people call them high wheels. That's kind of a 20th, 20th century term. But this is very uh, kind of Baroque. It's just incredible. And I was driving down the street in Newburyport, and this was in the yard for part of a yard sale. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, Are you yeah. And I pulled over, and I was. <laughs> I was a man of meager means. I had one, two children that were on the eve of going to college, and I was, I was a little strapped. But I went up to the owner. I said, you know, I have a couple of those wheels. Why don't I give you one that has all this tackle and so on already set up? And you could sell it so much easier. She, he said, really? I said, yeah. If you said, well, just could work out a trade. I'll never forget. I probably should have been stopped for speeding. I went home. <laughs> I got that wheel. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is, was um, used during the exhibition at New England Begins in 1982 in the Museum of Fine Arts. It's my oldest wheel. Yeah. How old is that? I, I think it's probably first quarter 18th century. Yeah. But it's in the manner of the 17th century. This is all riven out. Mm -hmm. Look at the beading. If you want to get up close, you can see there's punch work on, on the end of it. If you take this and turn it upside down, it looks like what you would see in William and Mary chest. You know? Crazy. So your skin goes on there. You, you spin off the point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, this, is, this is where you make the yarn. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is wool and this is flax. This is a little, I'm going to explain this. This is a little deceiving here where we have the uh, I'm trying to get out of your way. Okay. Oh, yeah, over here would be good. Okay. Right. Where you you uh, so the reason the little no ball of yarn is here is to protect people from the point. <laughs> Sometimes you could use a potato, an apple, a cork, whatever. But um, for the purposes of the exhibition, we, we just put on a little ball of yarn. But um, this is a spinning wheel, and you would take the wool, the raw wool from the basket there in the back, use the hand cards that are there um, to take, oops, that's okay, take the fibers and put them, stay, put them um, on the cards to get uh, the wool fibers all going in the same direction for spinning purposes. So then you would have um, what's called a roll-egg of wool, combed wool, and you would, it's known as a walking wheel because you would attach your roll leg of raw wool to the existing yarn that you've already spun here, and not the ball, just here. And uh, as you walk back and turn the wheel, 
you're, you're spinning off the point. That point is twisting and it's sending a twist up the wool that you're holding. So, um, and then when you've gone out as far as you can go and still reach the wheel, you turn the wheel in the other direction and wind your finish yarn onto the spindle. But um, when your spindle's full, that's the point at which you start winding the yarn off, um, on probably skein. onto a skeiner, not into a ball. Or a knitting knot, you could go. On, this is also a measuring tool, mm -hmm. two yards around and 40. Um, 40 yards yep. is still called a knot. Nitty 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 nitty, two heads, one body, you see. Right. There's a poem to go with it. Um, but this is true. Say that again, please. Nitty nitty. Nitty, it's a nitty knotty. We don't have a word. Nitty knotty, nitty knotty, two heads, one body. And no. then you say, here's one, ain't mm -hmm. one, will be one, by and by. Here's two, two, two. will be two, by and by. Bye. Here's three. And keep going up to 40. <laughs> and then, then that's yeah. full scale. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that was a standard <laughs> uh, measure. measure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is a wool wheel. This is a wool wheel. And the wheel in the back is a flax wheel. Um, and wool, right? You can spin wool on a flax wheel, but it was designed... Um, it had to be very fine. It was designed the wheel was designed for flax. For flax. Yeah. Yep. So... Um, so if it looks similar to that, it's probably a flax wheel? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and you can... Um, the. Yep. Is that a treadle? Or? It's, it's a, a treadle wheel. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, that's, I can't remember, where did you locate that one, Peter? We have many. Oh. This one's, which one? Well, that, this has, everything has a story. Yeah. Um, I had an article in Early American Life, and I wanted to, I, I have, there's a Hugh Ramsey wheel, and uh, that was from Holderness or Londonderry, and I wanted that included in that particular article, so I wrote the article, and it came out, um, well, I can't remember the date, but it, when the article came out, it had only been on the newsstands for about two or three days. And I opened up my mailbox, and there was a letter from some woman that had got it in New York. She said, I loved your article, and it's obvious that you really love this spinning. I own a Hugh Ramsey, and I want you to have it. Wow. And she said, she would send it. I needed to pay the postage on it, mm -hmm. but it arrived within 10 days, and that's that wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wrote her and thanked her, and I said I'd be using it for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. And she was thrilled with that. So we've corresponded. Mm -hmm. And she was notified about this exhibition as well. Was so. flax imported or being grown in New England? Grown in New England. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And even in, in this area. Are those yep. dowels worn down from people's hands running over them? Where? Yeah. The, that one that's yes. really thin on the other side? Just oh, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Like chair rungs. Yeah. Yep. Wow, sure. It's pretty ancient. Yeah. Maybe we need this to a flax a spinning trip to the farm in the spring and we can I think show you do. show how these work. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, yeah, we'd love to have it. Our farm is dedicated to pre industrial textile technology. Right. What we did is we we found this old cape on Diamond Hill Road. It took us years. It's still a in process. Progress, work in progress. <laughs> work in progress. That is the word. Um, but lots of friends and, and uh, family members have helped us over the years. And then um, we took a barn that was in Durham, Maine, just north of uh, of um, Portsmouth, uh, Portland, and we had it disassembled and moved to our property and put back up. Wow. And that whole barn is for spinning and weaving. So it's yeah. really, it's been published and right. we've got groups um, coming. So. What, we, what we really strive to do there is not only teach individuals, which we like to do, but um, there are many um, house museums throughout New England. I mean, whether they're part of a larger organization like Strawberry Bank, or maybe they're just a single house in a single town that has a historical society and there are volunteers giving tours. Well, what we like to do is offer to them an afternoon or a day when they can come and even if they don't use these pieces or any of these tools that are used for in the processing of flax, 
Maybe they don't use them at their historic site, but if they come and use them at our house, at our barn, then they can best explain to the, to the, their audience how yeah. they were used locally. So um, that's... Yeah. Our farm really is a teaching farm. Yeah. Is, the, is what, we're, what we love to do. Um, as you look at this case, um, take a look at the charts that we have here as well, because on this side, you start with the sheep and you end up with the cloth, and you'll see many of the items in the gallery today in those images. And then also this one is the flax version, the flax plant down to the bolt of linen. So, and most of the tools are here. There are two tools in, this, in these images. Um, they appear in both that were too big for this gallery. <laughs> one is called the scarn, um, which, you know, not to get too involved in weaving, but it's, it's big and it holds many bobbins that you use to wind the warp threads. And then when you're measuring the warp, there's a warping frame. The warping frames aren't are really much bigger than they're even portrayed in those images. They're, they can be up to um, nine feet across and six feet high. What's the hackle used for? The hackle is part of the flex processing um, process. And yeah, you sort of have to read the chart here to see what the steps are. but. Um, and come to the farm because we have a flax break and then there's the scutching board, um, the hackle. It helps, in it, the short version would be to say it separates the fibers inside the, the flax stalk okay. so that um, you can spin them and determine what weight yarn you want or thread. <coughs> the botanical name for flax is linum. Yeah. 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 So we should set them free. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, wander about. Yeah, yeah. wander about. There's um, yeah. lots of things to look at. The yeah. images that show people at work with these, at these activities, as well as um, this is a, a ledger from the old Berwick histo historical collection. Um, of course, we wanted to include their things as well. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's see. <coughs> those are hurdles over there. Those that fences. Yeah. I had those made in England and shipped here, so we have a number of them, so we can show that type of, of fencing. A hurdle is a, a, hurdle. a method of containing sheep. You, know, you can move the sheep around so they're spreading manure, and it's a uh, but fence. they're contained, and then. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are watercolors. We have we have a lot of of, of uh, artwork that relates to the textile industry, pre-industrial. So this is a, um, this one over here. Uh, this is a lady spinning that's English. It's done by Paul Sandby. Uh, we have some other uh, sketches there. These are from the Royal Academy in England. And um, this will be going to the National Trust of Scotland. These were done in Scotland uh, when we're done with them. So we've made arrangements with the National Trust to yeah, have these transferred. We have one drop spindle on display here. This is uh, people can talk about here. and a distaff, oh, yeah. which is which holds your raw flax. This is uh, yeah. You see these all over. This is called the whirl. Give it a whirl. You've side. heard that expression. That's the whirl. That's the shaft. Mm -hmm. This is very very rare. This is called a distaff. And a distaff. This is a type of distaff that would be worn in the belt or girdle. That's a distaff on the flax wheel there. You see that holding, holding, the, raw holding the raw flax. We do not have much use of those in the colonial period here. However, when we found this one, I had it analyzed and the wood is maple and it's New England maple. So that is very special. Or Middle Ages and earlier, right? Sorry? The Middle Ages and earlier for the distaff? Oh, well, this distaff mm -hmm. it goes way back, yeah. Yeah, Remember the, the, yeah, the, the tombs of the pharaohs. Um, you know, they're wrapped in linen, the mummies. And they were spinning with those, yeah. That's amazing. This is a 17th century dye recipe book. That's the earliest book published on dyeing in America, that one, the country. Yeah. 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 They talked about yeah, it's a yeah, for, yeah, for dying, yeah. 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 Okay. As well as pots like this yeah. that'd be for yeah. Yeah. 
could be for human union, uh, urine. In a tour earlier, we, we talked about, or I talked about, space being at a premium. Like, you know, that was one way of solving it. You could fold it up during the day. Well, this is another way of handling sleeping arrangements. This is called a uh, settle bed. And um, normally, this is, a, this is an 18th century bed tick, but normally it would, we could open spread it up it even more, spread it out. And then you could bed. walk in there. And, you know, yep. so. Family of four foot now. That's yeah. right. So, and you get, <laughs> you've got some, yeah, you could stack the kids <laughs> like cord wood. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but it also it deals with heat retention and so on. Uh, yeah. We see these, um, we think this is northern Vermont, but um, I have found exact, exact measurements, paneling, everything in Ireland. So it's, um, you know, it was a fairly common form. So mm -hmm. look at the spline here and so on, how the construction. It's so beautiful. It's, it really is a mm -hmm. pretty. What wood is it? Uh, there's a side of me, well, I think it's multiple woods. It might be, um, I'm, I'm thinking this might be chestnut, but I'm not mm. sure of that. A so. couple of hinges are original. Yeah, there's some original hinges, and then they put some modern ones on it. And um, I've had another pair made up, but we just installed it here. So I could take those modern ones out, because I had the, those hinges repaired, so, but I haven't made the transfer yet. Kind of fun. So, did you want to try that, Lori? No, I think uh, I'll be all right. That be your deer stand. Some of them don't have yeah, yeah. And I don't know if this, I don't know if this, yeah, yeah. 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 Shall we, Nan? Shall we, Nan? Yeah. Nancy, shall we? I'm coming. Okay. What's the name of this? A settled bed? Settle bed. Settle is usually a seating, uh, seating furniture. Yeah. A settle, a large, tall back settle. That you, you don't see too many of them. Faith time. Smith, who I've talked about, she had one, and I said, someday I'm going to find a settle. It took me probably 20, 30 years. And then I, I think we've only, owned, I found this probably about 20 years ago. We're at a, a museum in Connecticut, and that says Jay Cook. We love that block. That's for um, marking uh, bales of, uh, of wool. And we left a note at the desk of the museum because we saw it was a loaned object. It wasn't part of the museum's collection. And we said, we would love to buy that if, if the person ever wants to sell it. We had no idea who the person was, but we just said it'd be great. I think it was probably two or three years later we were having breakfast, I'll never forget this. And a man calls and said, Did, is this the cook? Are you the cooks that liked my wool block? I said, what are you talking about? Down in Connecticut? I said, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, you said you might want to buy it. I said, well, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, tell me about it. Well, if you'd like to buy I can't remember, it was a very nominal price, so it wasn't. I said, well, yeah, we could do that. Well, we're at the Hampton toll booths, and we're coming through. <laughs> you never saw anybody run out of the house. So, so we met them at a rest area and purchased them. I mean, that was, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. But we were living in Berwick at the time. But. Would they have dipped that in ink? To stamp, use it yeah, to stamp? or paint. It's loaded. You know, take lots of different kinds of paint color and so on. They dab it in paint and then slap it on the, on the bale. So. Kind of fun. This is Tear Shirt Farm in Berwick, Maine. This is our home. What road is it on? It's on Diamond Hill Road. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So this is this is where we live. That's so nice. It's like going back in time every day. See, there's a flax wheel there. I'm going to show you. Oh, do you see this? Mm -hmm. No, well, this is the bed I was telling you about. This is where I woke up this morning. That quilt is there, right there. But it's all folded up. 
Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. Yeah. It means a lot to us to have you, to share with you. I know. Um, I mean, friends. this is stuff that, um, have them call you know. Yeah. We'll give them another tour. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh.